Hello everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pete Bryant and I am president of the Society for Radiological Protection. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to another joint uh, event between SRP and AURPO on an introduction to decommissioning a non-nuclear facility. Uh, this is a topic which is really, really close to my heart, noting I started my career out in decommissioning. So it's great to have a topic uh, on, on this. Um, we've actually got a great number of attendees again. We have over 200 registered attendees for this webinar, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, in terms of ground rules, we have a very consistent set of ground rules. Um, it's questions will be asked at the end of a presentation, but what we'd ask people to do is there should be a Q&A box, which you can access. It's just a little kind of symbol with a question mark on it on your screen. If you click on there, you can ask any questions throughout the event. Um, if you see a question that you particularly like and want answered, please click on the like buttons because we normally get so many questions throughout the event. We will try and answer as many of those which are highest liked. Anything else we'll take away at the end of the event um, and we'll email out something which is the answers to all of those questions um, later on. If you also would like to claim CPD points from these webinar programs, then what you need to do is within that Q&A box, you will see Charlene's put up a statement at the start which gives you a code. What you need to do is email that code to Charlene and she will send you a confirmation email that you attended the webinar. This can then be used for CPD purposes. Uh, as always, please also send your feedback at the very end of the event. Um, we always want to hear about new webinar suggestions um, and also what you thought about the event as well and how we can improve it. We've got a new webinar coming up shortly, um, uh, which would be also in partnership with AURPO on an introduction to Gamma Spec, and that'll be on the 24th of July uh, between 12 and 1. Um, but we've also got many other topics in discussion at the moment, which we're looking at running as well. So don't worry, the webinar programme will keep on going. Um, but with that in mind, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker just to do a quick introduction, which is AURPO President Professor Peter Cole, which I'm sure a lot of you already know. Um, so with that, um, over to Pete. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Pete. Um, Welcome to those uh, attending this webinar from the UK and also to those attending from various different countries around the world. Everyone is most, most welcome. Once again, it gives me great pleasure to say that AURPO is collaborating with SRP uh, on the provision of this series of uh, free online training webinars. Uh, these are not only aimed at the needs of our membership, but are also hoped, we hope, aspire to support the wider radiation protection community and promote knowledge exchange both nationally and internationally. So today's uh, webinar will be presented by Ms. Julie Turner from Loughborough University, where she is a strategic scientific development officer and radioactive waste advisor. At Loughborough, she leads on radiological, biological and chemical safety and has worked in the field of radiation protection for over 20 years. Julie is my colleague on the AURPO Executive Committee, where indeed she is the AURPO Treasurer and Membership Secretary. So today's webinar is all to do with decommissioning of non-nuclear radiation facilities and Julie's going to draw examples from uh, a, a Loughborough project, which was the decommissioning of a 60 year old radiochemistry facility. She'll be assisted today by Dr. James Holt, who is a radiochemist and is part of Julie's team at Loughborough, where he is a radiation decommissioning officer. James will join in towards the end in the Q&A session at the, at the end of this uh, presentation. So without any further ado, I shall hand you over to Julie. So thanks for Pete for the introduction. As mentioned, this is an introduction to the decommissioning a non-nuclear facility, which is indeed a 60 year old radiochemistry building. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the background, so the background of the building, why it was there, how it's been used why we decided to decommission internally, because that's quite unusual for a university for a whole building, what the early stages of that process 
this was the governance and our involvement with the environment agency around this, our initial plan and then our updated plan once we'd actually done some historical research, the progress throughout this decommissioning and some of the importantly some of the lessons learned and some of the experience we've gained from doing this. It is going to be a whistle stop tour because obviously the timing this is project's been going on for two years and there's so many things we could tell you about so I'll try to condense it down into interesting areas that you might find useful. So the Graham Olden building is in the middle of our university campus in our central park and it's got a little circle coming up now. So it's right in the middle. It's got a chemistry building next to it. It's got lots of other areas, so it's not really away from anywhere else. It was built in 1958 and it was purpose built for radiochemistry work. So it was actually built for that purpose. Originally, it was named the nuclear chemistry building, which did cause some anxiety for the local called Neighbours around the Loughborough area and later because of those kind of challenges it was changed to the Graham Olden building named after the first radiation protection officer who worked within there and you can see from the photos you can see the extraction and the chimney stack and also the semicircle concrete circle that was in front of the building which was there to provide shielding for a cobalt 60 irradiator source. So the purpose it was purpose built and it it's one story. It had dedicated rooms that have been repurposed since the original concept. So on the original map here, we had a radio isotope lab, nuclear physics lab, but we also had a neutron generator which had tritium targets that was decommissioned in 1988 and the cobalt-60 irradiator which was decommissioned in 2006. And we have the records for those, so we know that was successfully done. The timeline up to the closure, we had the extension built in 19. 1982, which added on a X-ray facility and more offices. Then between 89 and 2003, we had additional extraction and ventilation updates, and you'll see these in some of the plans. In 2009, they completely replaced all the flooring and changed the wooden benches to trespa benching, as you would expect in a modern radiochemistry facility. Then in 2004, we had what was called the high activity lab, which was a lab that where they used and dispensed all the high active sources. It was a waste store and also where they had um, aqueous disposal. And as you can see from this picture, very old, very tired looking. It had an old macerator, very small sink. So that was decommissioned and by AMEC and then recommissioned into a much more modern facility with splashbacks and much brighter. We changed the lights and everything. So that work was done in 2014. So this is the current building and I'm just going to take you through it so you can see what we were up to when we had to decommission. So as you go into our radiochemistry facility, you would go into the locker room, which obviously had all the lab coats. It had cleanup kit, emergency spill areas and also was the entrance to the supervised areas. Now, some of these photos have been taken since we started the decommissioning, so it'd be less busy than what it was when it was actively being used. But if you go into the map, you'd go into the first of our three main laboratory areas, which you can see hopefully on the picture coming up. These had the labs, so the students would work at benches, they'd have all their radioactive items in those trays. But because this whole area was used for radiation work, it was assumed that most things in this area could possibly be radioactive. So in fact, we actually labelled non-radioactive things more than the rest because we knew most things were radioactive. We had few birds that the students were constantly in use, lots of pipettes, lots of tubes, of course, as you would expect. We then went into sort of a prep area, which originally had a biosafety cabinet in it as well, had lots of files, chemicals, incubators and also purified water. All the things you would expect in a modern um, chemistry prep area. It had a little room coming off that, which is where the ICPs had um, sat. So we had an MS ICP and an OES ICP, which has been gone in this photograph, but that was used for some of the students samples. And then back into the high activity lab that I showed you. On the previous slide, but this also shows you the fume hoods where they did the dispensing. They also had a lead K for some of the really active gamma emitters, the safe for the sealed sources, and it's also where they kept some of the waste sim bins. Then across to the second main area, 
again you can imagine this would have had all the trays of all the student samples in the side bench would have been full with phd uh, ph meters balances completely in use this is after we started decommissioning so it's quite empty appearing then into the final section of the lab again trays of student works we used to have a glove box in this area for alpha emitting radionuclides and you can also see on the ceiling the air socks that brought the fresh air into the lab as the fume has drew out the older air we had a county room which had liquid scintillation counters in gamma counters icps uh, so not icps um gamma spec alpha spec and also an xrf which we use for all the analysis there was a storeroom which had additional equipment and extra samples but did used to have a glove box that had long-term air sensitive experiments in as well and then finally on the end this is part of the extension there was a new x-ray lab built which had four xrd units the typical modern ones which are completely enclosed and interlocked so they are on the extension at the end what did they do in the radiochemistry buildings? Well, they did lots of research, radionuclides specific to the nuclear industry and their transportation throughout cement was a big focus on a lot of research. Relationship between radionuclides and polymers as part of the potential cleanup operations, absorption experiments of clay in the presence of humic acid. So lots of different types of research, particularly around the nuclear industry. Um, then we also had lots of teaching. So there was teaching with carbon-14 um, labelled paracetamol, ion exchange experiments, and a lot of the teaching was carried out within that laboratory. So they had um, undergraduate practicals of sort of around 20 to 30 students in there, and they also had project students doing very specific work. So that meant this building had everything from really low energy beaters like tritium and carbon-14 right up to uranium, plutonium and radium sources. We also had natural uranium and thorium salts that we use for experiments, uh, sealed sources, mostly the sealed sources after the cobalt-60 source was decommissioned were sources for calibrating radiation monitors or calibration sources for the equipment, so quite low level sealed sources. We also have quackery items, so radiological interesting items like old um, items that could have been used for radium, so sort of suppositories and corsets and all types of things you've seen in, uh, in museums. We had quite a few selections of these which students would look at and be interested in. We had norm, so we had sand samples, rocks, oil and gas scale, all sorts of types of norm, and then typical chemicals that you would associate with a chemistry department. So lots of different things. So why then did we decide to close this facility? Well, first of all, the academics, the main academics within this area left to go to other organisations. And this at the same time, chemistry were asked to restructure and to simplify what they did. So it made sense to stop the radiochemistry element because it's quite an expensive part, but also the academics were leaving that area anyway. Chemistry, the main chemistry builder, was moving to a new refurbished labs on the other side of campus. So that would have left a massive gap about a mile distance between the chemistry and the radiochemistry area. Radiochemistry practical teaching had also stopped at this point. And with the building was starting to look tired, we would have had to refurbish it. We would have had to replace the flooring and done some refurbishment. So it's a good time to say, OK, let's stop. So that meant Loughborough University had to make some decisions. If we were going to stop open source work, and this was the only building which had open source radioactive work in Loughborough. So if we were going to stop all open source, then we may, then we're going to have to surrender our open source permit. And to do that, we're going to have to decommission this facility. They also decided they wanted to demolish the building. So the building, could, then the area could be used for further development if needed. So we needed to decide whether we were going to decommission externally or internally. And the reason why we decided to, in, to decommission internally was partly based on the fact we still had PhD students. So the academics left, but there were still some PhD students who remained at Loughborough and they were going to be there for another 12 months or so. So we could start decommissioning around those students, leave them doing their work. and We could start taking out some of the consumables and some of the other items around the area. 
We also had the expertise and competence in our staff. We had three postdoctoral researchers who have got PhDs in radiochemistry. We had a, a extremely experienced technical staff and of course radioactive waste advisor and an external RPA. So we had all the people that we needed. We also had chemists and other competent people. We have all the equipment. We have the radiation monitors. We had XRF, gamma and alpha spectrometry, liquid scintillation counters we, and we, importantly we had the calibrated standards to go with those. Another important factor is we had time. There was no rush for this building. There was no rush for the university to get us to surrender the permit or knock the building down. So we could do this quietly and carefully over a couple of years. We had brilliant historical data and I cannot tell you how important historical data is. It means we could prove where things were decommissioned previously. We could have a look at what went wrong previously. And we found out some quite surprising things looking back at the historical data. And we also had a good governance system in place to keep an eye and make sure that we had the correct scrutiny to do the job successfully. So once we decided we were going to do it internally, we had to look at what we needed to do in the early stages. The most important thing we needed to do was liaise with the Environment Agency, and I'll speak more about that in a moment. We needed to look at all our waste disposal routes. How are we going to get the waste away from the area? What were we going to do? We needed to set up a project management board to, govern, to give governance and apply that scrutiny that we needed. So on this project management board, we had chemists, so we had professors to give us that scrutiny around the science that we were suggesting. We had the people from the decommissioning team. We had the head of our health and safety service. We had myself. We had facility finance and planning team. And that was chaired by a member of the senior leadership team, which actually was our finance director in this case. But we also needed to feed into the radiological protection committee because we needed to make sure that we were doing everything safe and in accordance to our permits. So it fed into our RP committee, which was chaired by our chief operating officer and into the University Health and Safety Environment Committee. So it had a lot of governance around it. We were required to have reports going out to all these committees and groups on a regular basis. We created a risk matrix so we could really understand what happens if things went wrong. If we started to take the flooring off in an area, what would we find? Would we have the waste capacity on our permits to dispose of it? All those kind of questions were there. We then engage with some stakeholders, the neighbours, the PhD students who were still in the lab, the chemists, all the people around and make sure that everyone knew what we were doing and were happy. And then, of course, we had to secure funding for the consumables, liquid scintillation vials. We've probably used thousands of liquid scintillation vials. So that's a really important thing to cost up, um, the staffing time and, of course, the waste disposal costs. So liaison with the Environment Agency, as I said, extremely important. We needed to know if they were happy for us to do it internally, what they would expect for our full permit surrender, what they would want to see, what they would want to see evidence. We also wanted to get guidance from them around the surrender documentation. There's lots of forms you need to fill out. We wanted to be clear right from the start what we needed to do. So we got some really good advice from them. We wanted to establish regular communication so they knew what we were doing and they were happy and they could come to us with questions or vice versa. We needed to establish clearance levels for the de decontamination. Now we've had it easier than some places because we decided we would go for, we would not leave any radioactivity there. So we would go for outer scope. We would dispose of or decontaminate. Now, we might need to readdress that if we'd actually found something that we couldn't deal with, but that was our starting point. We wanted to discuss with them our waste disposal routes, which I'll talk to you about in a moment, and also the process of if we needed to permit, vary our permit if we found some problems with something we needed to deal with. So from that, we decided we'd have our, we created our initial plan. We do a full historical search, understand the types of radio radionuclides we've used within the facility over the 60 year period, and what may still be present in our drains and extraction establish the monitoring, identification and quantification equipment that we would need and the processes around that, a full decommissioning plan, write the asset, so the standard operating procedures and RAs, risk assessments, and do little things like make sure we had electronic workspace where we could put all the data. Buy a camera, you need to take photographs of everything. So we bought a high quality camera where we can do this. So the first thing we did is we looked at 
the waste disposal. We updated our best available technique, the BAT, to make sure it incorporated what we wanted to achieve through the decommissioning. And we wanted a process where, where we could reuse the equipment, we could decontaminate it and take it out and reuse it in other areas. Glassware, for example, was checked and decontaminated. And if it was clean, it could be donated to local secondary schools. So, and also then we'd want to recycle where we could recover and then finally use the disposal for where we just couldn't do with anything else. We then needed to look at our permitted waste route. So what could we could dispose of with gaseous and aqueous discharge and our solid waste routes. Also how we could use the very low level waste exemption. But then really importantly, what do we do with the non radioactive waste? Are we going to recycle that? Do we have a process? There's a lots of things in that building we need to get rid of. And then critically hazardous waste, chemical waste, nasty things that we need to deal with in the correct legal way, but might not be radioactive. So here are the weight permitted waste options. Well, permitted, sorry, our permit waste options for our permit, our current permit. We've got gaseous waste. And if you'll notice it's only carbon 14 and tritium. That's the only thing that we could ever dispose of for our gaseous waste through the fume hoods. Then we've got aqueous waste, which was split into carbon 14 and tritium. Another group, which was beta and gamma emitters, and another which was alpha emitted radionuclides. So importantly, we had alpha emitting on our aqueous disposal waste routes, and we had quite a good capacity for beta and gamma. Then we also had liquid scintillation and solid waste routes, which go to a specialised waste contractor. So we were we had faith that we had some really good permitted limits that did not need changing at this point. Then we had very low level waste. So as you'll be aware, with very low level waste exemptions, we can dispose of 40 kilobecquels a single item or up to 400 kilobecquels per um, 0.1 meter squared uh, cube, sorry. And or tritium, you obviously 400 kilobecquels. And there's a maximum you can do per year. But that doesn't explain all about very low level waste. You have to be really careful that you consider things like the constant concentration of activity measured before you mix it with other waste. How are you going to add it into non radioactive waste? You have to consider the on the right hand side there. You see you've got maximum limits. You need to make sure that you don't mix it with permitted waste where you can. But also, is it appropriate to go in very low level waste? Is it hazardous? Is it got chemical hazards that we don't want it going in there? Has it is the dose rate too high? All of these things need to be considered to make sure that we only use this route when it was appropriate to do so. So then we looked at our permits and if you remember before the EPR permits came out, you would have a registration for your holdings and an authorization for your disposals. So this is our holdings and the we went back to all the permits that we could find. I started in 2011, but I had to go back and find any data that we had. We also went to the Environment Agency to see what data they had on this. And as you can see, probably unusual for university, we've used lots of different isotopes which were listed on these permits over the years. Then we've also got the authorizations. And again, that went back to roughly 1991. And this is pretty similar, pretty standard across the years. Strontium 90 is added in 2012. Yeah, 2012 and sorry, um, 2005, sorry. And then we had an increase in alpha emitting disposals in 2012. So pretty static other than that across the time. We did also look at our sealed source permits. Now I spoke to our environment agency inspector this week to make sure I could show you this slide because of course sealed source permits are restricted. So you'll notice I've taken the permit numbers off, but I've also not included our most two current permits. So these are legacy permits that we no longer have any of these sources. So that's why I'm OK to talk to you about them. And what I wanted to show you about the sealed source permit is we wanted to be sure if you look at all the historical permits that we have disposed of these sources and we've got the evidence to prove that we've disposed of these sources. So if you see the top line, the cobalt 60, code number six, two terabecals originally, we know we had that through our permits. In 2000, it was changed to a 500 gigabecal. This is the cobalt 60 irradiated source, of course, and we've got the disposal date. I've got the records. I've got the sheet from the company that took it. We know that's gone. And we did that for every single legacy source that we had to ensure that we had the proof and the records to show that it had been disposed of correctly. 
So what have we disposed of then? How do we know what's gone down our aqueous disposal routes? So this was a big piece of work looking at our disposal records. And we luckily had handwritten disposal records dating back to 1976. And what I did, you've just got a snapshot here, which is a very busy slide, I agree, but you don't need to worry too much. It, it's actually four pages, this slide, of all the isotopes that have been disposed of down our acres waste discharge. So on the left hand side, you've got the dates and on the top, you've got the isotopes. So initially we did everything, then we removed all the short half-lives that no longer would be an issue in our drains. They would have decayed by now. So we took those out and we were left with this. As you can see, there's lots. Carbon-14, uh, tritium, iodine, right up to different types of uranium. You'll notice interesting things like nickel-63 we started using in 79, and fascinating things like the chlorine-36 we discharged in 79 and then stopped using it for ages and started using it again. So there was interesting patterns of usage, and if you're a radiation protection geek, it was quite interesting to see the pattern of usage across the years. And if you take a closer look, this is just zoomed into the top hand, you can see this is in mega becquerels. We weren't disposing of a great deal each year, even our carbon-14 and tritium. So what else did we look at? Well, we've got Radiation Protection Committee minutes and reports to the University Council from 1966 to the present. And the photograph you see here is a report to Council on the work of the Radiation Protection Committee. It was actually written by Graham Oldham our first RPO and here you can see that they had an inspection and the inspector said it was it expressed their general satisfaction. It tells you how many radiation workers there were and this would provide us any information of anything interesting or anything that had happened that we might need to know about doing our decommissioning. We've also got communication from the regulatory bodies back to the 60s. So every time we were inspected by the HSC or the Environment Agency or whatever they were called at that time, we have letters and communication from them, which is really good. And again, informs you of any issues they might have had with um, Loughborough University's use of radiation across that time. We had original plans of the building, mechanical and engineering plans of the extraction and drainage and some information on our significant events. So, for example, on the right hand side of this slide, you'll see the original blueprint for the building. Very hard to see what's going on there. I've had to take it from a stool because it's A0 size, but it just shows you we've got those original plans. And the one on the left is a sort of CAD style plan from 1958. So we had really good basic plans. And we also had good mechanical electrical plans. So the first picture here is a CAD plan of the first extraction amendments and adjustments they did in the 90s, which shows you where they are. And then this later slide shows you the latest, and this is the most modern extraction plan that we've got. And this is what's on our roof currently. So this shows you the extraction coming out of our fume hoods. It shows you where the fan is and it shows you how the fresh air gets into the building. So when we're decommissioning this, we know how this extraction could be broken down and checked and monitored. So this was a really good piece of information. And we also had drainage maps. We have the original blueprint, again, handwritten and drawn where the foul drain goes to from the building. And then later on, we had sort of CAD style diagrams as well. So we were really, we were pretty confident that we knew where the drains were going. And later on, I'll talk to you about the drainage survey and how we proved that the drains were going where we expected them to be going. So we also had significant events, which we mentioned from the regulatory issues that we found out or adaptions to infrastructure, but we also had the previous decommissioning report. So when AMEC did the high activity lab in 2014, we've got that survey and records. We've got monitoring records and incident accident reports from time working in the lab. So we know if there were contamination issues and how these were dealt with. And then we've got reports on unexpected events, fires and floods. But what we have got is the photos, the intervention and the monitoring records to show you that these were dealt with correctly. So one of the surprises that I found that we ha they had a fire in October 1990, 1983. And here you've got sort of a slideshow, which I found in the archives of the of the destruction it did to the lab. It was a pressure cooker in a fume hood that caught fire and they're working with Technetium 99M at the time. As you can also tell, because it was a called the Nuclear Chemistry Building, the newspapers at the time had a bit of a fun with it and of course said there was a nuclear leak in the lab and etc. Which I think around this time is when they decided to change the name. 
Um, so, but we have the monitoring records to prove it was monitored. We had the fire brigades report on this. We had the regulatory bodies talking to us about this. So we had all the information to know that this fire wouldn't have left any contamination within the building now. We've had a few flooding issues. The one on the left is a storm that Loughborough University had in 2012. Most of Leicestershire had it. Massive storm. Virtually every building in Loughborough University had some kind of water egress in this. And what we've got from the photographs and the evidence is that it didn't penetrate the radiochemistry facility, just all the offices around it. So that was good that we had that information. We also had water dripping into our equipment room which you've got the photographs and some monitor records. When we went up to the roof, we, have, we noticed we had a paddling pool and that was because the leaves had been blocked in the drain. So the good thing is we had the photographs to show, yes, these incidents happened, but also the trail of how we ensured it was safe and everything was good. So that leads us to what is still in the building that we need to be aware of. Obviously, we still got the open and sealed source radioactive sources, uranium and thorium salts. This photograph shows you a source from 1939. So that's how some of our uranium nitrate stocks are quite old, but used for a very long time. Um, we had academic legacy items to where the academics left. We still had some of their items and student samples, students who'd left or gone with the academics. We still had some of their samples and of course the PhD students who were still present. We had contaminated equipment that needed to be dealt with before we could get rid of it. And then we had all the consumables, pipettes, um, measuring jugs, bottles, you name it, we had it. And then, of course, the infrastructure itself, the benches, the sinks, the pipe work, the fume hoods. So just bear with me a minute because my slide's not moving. Ah! OK, so we adapted the plan to incorporate removing all the active sources and samples and then how we're going to deal with all the infrastructure. So we wanted to create a system to know what we're going to do, how we're going to dispose of and dismantle the bench, the sink, the pipes and how we're going to deal with all the equipment and the miscellaneous items. But most importantly, now we have those historical records we could look at what needed to be monitored. What do we need to do to ensure that we have disposed, we haven't got contamination? So unfortunately, because we know we've used low energy beaters, um, beta and gamma emitters themselves, alpha emitters, we know we need to monitor for everything. So we need to do wipe tests for those low energy beaters. We need to use, you know, gamma rate, um, monitors, but we also need to monitor for alphas. So we had to do everything. We needed to ensure that we could identify and quantify what the student samples were and so we could dispose of them accordingly. We also had those quackery items. Could they just be disposed of or were they still radioactive? What do we need to do about those? And we had to decide how we we're going to monitor and decontaminate and what we we're going to donate to other organisations and what we could give to other places. So this very busy slide of lots of photos just kind of shows you the amount of consumables we were talking about. I'm sure all who's worked in a university lab will be familiar with the cupboards we're looking at here. Lots and lots of glassware, lots of pipettes, lots of retort stands. Everything here had to be wipe test and monitored and you can imagine how long that can take. All the lead blocks that were used to protect us about the gamma emitters had to be wipe test, checked and if contaminated, washed, with deconiety generally and retested again. Everything had to be tested. And that goes through to the next section, large cupboards full of Duran bottles, funnels, measuring cylinders, cupboards of tools, all of these things had to be checked. And that was time, um, time consuming. We had a technician who was virtually just wipe testing all the time. We also had, unfortunately, contaminated equipment. So we had 77 items of equipment gifted from an ex-pharmaceutical plant in Loughborough, gifted to an academic, which was good because we needed the equipment at the time. But what was found is all this equipment was highly contaminated with tritium and carbon-14. So contaminated it was given quite high dose rates at the surface. And the contamination was fixed. It was impregnated into the actual equipment. So we had a puzzle of how we were going to deal with this because we couldn't take it for we. So that's the electrical disposal route because it was contaminated. What were we going to do? 
So at the start, we would dismantle the item. And here I'm going to bring you up a picture. So this is a typical magnetic stirrer. We'd have monitored it, known that it's contaminated. We would dismantle it into pieces, soak it in Decon 90, monitor it again. Sometimes we would have to use acetone to remove paint. And on some occasions, aqua regia, so that's nitric acid and hydrochloric acid, to actually strip off the contamination. If we use that, we'd have to neutralise and then this liquid could be used as aqueous disposal. But you can see from this photo, sometimes we'd have to go right down to the wiring of the equipment. It was that badly contaminated inside the equipment. The wipe test would convert to activity per becquerel as in the last webinar, if you joined us, Ollie explained with the liquid scintillation counter. We use the most conservative efficiency for um, tritium rather than carbon-14, so we always overestimated the contamination rather than underestimated and then at the end we'd always have a list like this which showed you the breakdown of the parts the monitor response the activity in Beck rules and the total activity so this went at very low level waste because the activity was less than one kilo Beck rule. and you see although I've cut it off there's my signature next to it so I was as the RWA I was signing off every single piece of disposal as well then Surprisingly, the easiest things to deal with were the actual radioactive sources. So the sealed sources on the left of this slide, we kept the calibration sources because we need them. Some sources that were only a few kilobecquerels had decayed over the years could be disposed of using the very low level waste, except for sealed sources. And others over 185 kilobecquerels had to be disposed of by a specialist contractor. And we had a couple of collections where they would come and collect those sources for us. The open sources, we didn't, by the time we started decommissioning, we didn't have that many left. So some of them we could dispose of as aqueous waste under our permit conditions. That was fine. And some of the other ones, particularly the expensive ones like uranium-233 and radium-226, we would uh, donate those to other organisations if they had a need for them. Uranium-4 reum salts, again, we kept some in case we needed some later on for electron microscopy, for example. Others we sent to organisations that might want them. And again, the rest was sent either by waste contractor or disposed of via aqueous disposal if it was appropriate. So we had a mixture there. But these were all relatively easy compared to other areas. Student samples, again, not particularly problematic, but we needed to find out exactly what was in all of these tubes. So students are great at labelling and say they've got 20 tubes and they've got 10 kilobecquerels of nickel 63 in those 20 tubes. They had labels that say what was in what, but of course, then those students left and us to interpret their labeling system would prove quite difficult. So we had to individually check every sample to see what was in it, what needed to be done and how to dispose of it. And we had lots of those samples, as you can imagine. Then we also had quackery items. I'm sure we've all got these in some of our university areas. So suppository, condom tins, radioactive toothpaste, corsets, all sorts of things, backscatter plates. Now, a lot of these weren't radioactive and could be either donated to people who wanted them or disposed of. The backscatter plates had to be decontaminated and that was fairly easy. But what we did suffer from was some that were actually really very hard to dispose of. So, for example, we had gas mantles, which were used in the 1900s to, uh, for lamps and lanterns and contained thorium. 6 to 12 percent weight of weight thorium in there so for a 60 gram gas mantle you can imagine there'd be about 0.6 grams of thorium in. now the problem is we have to report to your atom and nuclear safeguards for all our nuclear material so we had to report that we had these and also that we disposed of them and we had to tie that in with our specialist waste contract just so those figures match so that was quite expensive to dispose of this so i would say if you have academics who want quacker items do consider how you will dispose of them when you need to the other issue we had is with the revigorators here on the right hand side which is basically a ceramic pot which has been impregnated with uranium they actually give off quite a high radiation dose and can, and if I just click on the slide at the right you'll see the monitor you won't have any sound but you'll see the monitor go up as the as it's dosed, I can hear the, the guide counter going off. Also, it gives off a lot of radon. So you have to be careful of your work level exposure for radon with these items. We had to dispose of that, but the waste contractor and the um, your atom needed to know how much uranium was in these products. 
So that was difficult to tell. So we had to weigh them, we had to measure them, and we had to use them on the gamma spec and actually work out the activity. And it was worked out to be around 42 kilobecals of natural uranium. So when you take in the specific activity, we could work out that each of these revigorators had 1.6 grams of natural uranium. But that took a lot of effort for something that was really just there to show to amuse the students about the strange quackery items you used to have. So really consider before you have any of these items in. Then, of course, we had furniture, hopefully nice and easy to decontaminate and clean. Unfortunately, every time we removed floor to ceiling furniture, we would have surprises. For example, we found old extraction systems, which now need to be wiped, test and checked, just like everything else. So that was always a little bit of a uh, shame. So then lastly, and this is sort of the more difficult areas, is the infrastructure. So you, I will go through the things we did automatically so I don't have to keep repeating it. We did a full demolition asbestos survey. It's very important with a building from 1958 to know what asbestos is in that building. So we did that first really thoroughly. We had to know that. We did standard operating procedures and risk assessments for every, sexual, every single element. So we had one for fumigants, we had one for extraction, we had one for benches. We had a policy would wipe test and monitor everything before it left. We draw the diagram of the wipe test area so we could so go back if we had any areas of contamination and we would photograph everything. I have bored my team sensors with telling them to photograph everything. We photograph literally every single thing, but a photograph tells you so much. We would calculate the activity for any contamination and then decontaminate or dispose as required. So Here's a here's a SOP that we had for the bench and the little sinks in the benches. The little sinks within the benches were not never supposed to be used for active radiation, but of course we need to check to make sure. We would divide the benches up into sections so we could wipe, test and monitor. We would then deal with the sink, the pipe underneath the sink, start cutting that pipework down so we could monitor every section of the pipework, as you can see in these diagrams. And then finally, when we knew it was OK, we'd start actually removing the benches. So here you can see the press. If you ever see the Trespa bench being made up, these pictures show you how it's taken down. But then we noticed we were starting to paint ourselves into a corner because how do you test all the all the wipe tests? How do you run them through your instruments if you're trying to decommission the building? So we were luckily given a small health and safety lab, if you like, which could have our liquid scintillation counters and our gamma spec in where we could take self-contained uh, samples over, test them and then take them back to be disposed of. So there's no discharges in this area, but it does leave us a place to, to do the dry testing, which was great. So then we started with the fume hoods. And of course, the only thing that should have been up the fume hoods is tritium and carbon 14. But we did, of course, check for everything in case. You need to make sure the all the extraction is turned off, the electrics and the water are also isolated because of course the fume hoods are plumbed into everything. You'll see on the on the right hand side we diet we drew diagrams of all the areas that we wipe tested. We had, as I mentioned, the asbestos survey, and what we know now is to expect the unexpected. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. So here's a slide of the fume hood starting to be broken down. On the left hand side you can see we've removed the sort of the top plates and as we go further we're removing the facings of it. You can see the wooden panels between these are quite old fume hoods as you can tell. But what we did find, so what did we find that we weren't expecting? Although we had an asbestos survey underneath the fume hood cupboards when that was removed there were old asbestos tiles. So even though we have that demolition survey, we still found asbestos. That was fine. We had the good risk assessments that said if you stop and notice anything, all my decommissioning staff were trained on how to deal with asbestos. So they knew to leave it and call in the contractors to deal with it and do the surveys, the air surveys. We also found fire damage. So if we hadn't known about the fire in 1988, now we know about it because as we removed the fume hoods, we saw the fire damage left behind, which is interesting because it means in 1988 they didn't bother painting the walls after the uh, fire. We also found a block of lead at the bottom of the top part of the fume hood in our high activity lab, and we weren't expected to find lead in a fume hood, um, and they were really heavy to take out, so that was surprising. 
but the most probably the most worrying is the live wire that we found within one of our fume hoods so even though all the electrics were turned off the electricians came over and did that as as the decommissioned team were taking it apart they noticed a wire that didn't look right they called in the electricians and indeed it was live but it was from a legacy light that had been turned off and decommissioned, but the wiring was buried within the fume hood, so no one knew it was there. So that shows the real importance of the risk assessments and training of your decommissioning staff. They knew to stop and check these things before they progressed. We did find contamination, as you kind of expect, and it was carbon-14. It was in the top of the uh, extraction coming into the fume hoods. So on the left-hand side, you can see those uh, joints there where it was. It was very low level and it was calculated, but then it was cleaned with Decon 90 and completely removed. It was very easy to remove, which was nice. So then we moved on to the roof. So this is a photo of the extraction system. And if you remember that CAD plan from the start of the talk, it very much represented that. We had to work with our facilities team and scaffold contractors because we've got a chimney stack on there and we needed to take um, core samples. So we had lots of extraction, um, lots of scaffold input in. You'll see James, who's going to do some of the questions later, monitoring the outside of the stack. And this is a diagram that we drew showing where all the core samples were taken. So we knew exactly where we take them all. On this slide, you can see those core samples. These were all monitored and tested to make sure that we couldn't find any contamination. And then we moved on to the chimney stack. So as mentioned, we had to have the scaffolding and the right shows you that. And the chimney can be broken into several sections. The thick section with the fan, that's integral to the roof and really can't be moved. And then the baffled section and the top sections, which are much smaller, but are pretty hollow. So what did we do? You can see our facilities staff. So the, the chimney was monitored on the outside to make sure it was reasonably OK for our facilities staff to go up there. It was dismantled and sections were levered off the side of the building. On the right hand side, you can see some of the baffled sections there. So, of course, the fan section we couldn't remove, but we could get down and wipe test sections of it. And on the right hand side, there's the fan. You can see very old looking, but actually not contaminated, which was really pleasing. Here are some of the sections that we had in the lab that we can now test properly. So we monitored the outside when we were dismantling, but now we wanted to wipe test all the sections to make sure there really wasn't any contamination. And we'll just wait for my computer to catch up. Bear with me one moment. So the next slide will show you when it gets to it, a diagram of the baffled section of a um, the chimney and also the photograph and the wipe test results that we got for it. Here it is eventually. So you can see the diagram represents that baffled section. And then all the wipe tests we would label one, two, seven, et cetera. So we could correspond that to the results to make sure we knew what was contaminated and what wasn't. And here you've got those samples, Beckles per centimeter cube for the base and on the top. So very clear, very, un there was a few areas which were slightly contaminated, but once cleaned with decon, completely fine. Then the floors and walls were done in parallel with some of the other work but I just kept this at the end so you can see we gridded up the floors and the walls as we have done with the benches labeled them so we could wipe test and monitor we also then once we knew the floor was okay we then cut the floor into those sections so we could monitor the underneath of the floor to make sure the concrete wasn't contaminated as well each section would have tables like this. So this is a section of one of the labs, and this is the monitoring done by the Albi 124 monitor. And there'll also be another one for the liquid scintillation results. So where it's slightly redder is where we had slightly higher elements, but you notice the background was 12, and the highest one we got was a count of 18 on the dose rate meter, uh, so the contamination monitor. But we also had liquid scintillation counting done at the same time. My Wi-Fi is really not happy today. <laughs> so unfortunately, what we did find while we was doing the survey of the concrete floor is contamination within the concrete underneath one of the fume hoods. 
and once we get the slide I'll be able to show you let me just get it so the, while we're waiting the contamination measured 14 microsieverts an hour on the dose rate meter and 950 counts per second on the LB124 so it wasn't a massive contamination but it was there the spectrum analysis confirmed it to be nickel 63 and of course we did use nickel 63 quite a lot in the um, since the 1970 something so it was one that we would expect and there you, hopefully now you can see the pictures of the contamination so we monitored again this is an example of taking photographs we every time we found contamination we take photographs of the monitors to say this is what we found so how do we do to deal with that so we obviously did a new um, risk assessment the area was chiseled out the area was cleaned, the actual contamination was dealt with and went with low level waste. Then we re-monitored the flooring to make sure it was now background levels, as you can see in these pictures here. So for drains. So in 2012, we had a survey of our drains to see what type of contamination we had. And the only contamination it showed was the manhole directly outside the building. There was a little bit of sediment, a little bit of contamination that was removed and dealt with at the time. What we also did was put coloured dye into the drains to make sure that the map we had of the drains was actually accurate so we could see where the where the coloured water would go to. So what we've done since is we've had camera, a camera footage down there and we've also taken core samples of all of our manholes. So in this slide coming up now, you've got the Graham Olden building which is on the left of the map. And as you'll see slowly in your slides, all the manhole covers coming up here, we opened and took samples of. So 107, which is the one we were expecting to be the most contaminated, all the way round past the old chemistry building, down into the car park. We needed to check everything to make sure no contamination had gone down. We also wanted to check for heavy metals as well. So here's a couple of photos of some of the manhole covers. Some of them were deeper than others, and we, there were the core samples. We, some of, some of the samples that we've taken from those drains. The initial analysis shows they're not contaminated. But we also want to do gamma spectrometry, liquid synthesis and XRF on those samples still too. The camera survey, so we've got a video of what the drains look like from the inside and here's a photo of one of them. The waistline service group said all the drains were in acceptable structural condition. So we know the drains aren't leaking or having any issues, which is really reassuring. So this is just very briefly to show you now what the radiochemistry building looks like as previously where I showed you the photos. So that was our locker room. Now just a picture of grids and concrete floor. Don't worry if you, I whiz through some of these too quickly because it's now just basically empty floors. That's our first lab. So you can see the pipe coming up from where the, the um, uh, sinks would have been into what was our prep area, completely empty both sides and the ICP area now completely empty but this just gives you an example of just how much wipe tested monitoring has been carried out in this building that's our high activity lab no longer got the sink no longer got the fume hoods our second main research area completely empty this is where you can see some of that fire damage again and our third research area, the counting room. Now all the equipment has moved to our new health and safety lab, so that could be emptied. And of course the storeroom that was pretty empty anyway, but now is two. The XRD area had four XRDs. Two of them went up to our new chemistry facility. The other two were decommissioned. So um, the X-ray head was taken by hazardous waste because it contains beryllium and the rest went by we. But that room was also wiped, test and checked because occasionally they did run radioactive samples in there. So we just wanted to be thorough. So we did wipe, test and check that room as well. So what do we have left to do? Not very much anymore. All we need to do is the analysis of the drain samples. We need to remove the drainage system from the manhole cover directly outside the building. We decided, although we're not picking up much contamination, it would be good practice, best practice to remove that and thoroughly check it within the lab. So all the, on this picture here, you can see all this pipe work. We're going to take it all up. That damage of the pipe work you see on the photo is from a manhole cover when it came loose. So we're going to take all of that up and 
and analyze and, and do the analysis of it of the gamma spec, alpha spec, etc. We are going to take soil samples from around to make sure that that's OK and finish all the drainage. We're then going to do a full report for our records, which is going to have all the photographs in, all the wipe test records. So we have got a historical report that if someone in 20 years comes back and asks that question, we've got it all documented. And then we're going to go through the surrender application process for the Environment Agency with their documentation and provide the Environment Agency what they've asked us for. Just some key lessons learned. Do expect the unexpected. We have found that contamination in strange places. We found that fire damage. We found asbestos. We found interesting things. But the most important thing it's shown is that historical records are vital. So if you're a new RPO now, look at what you're doing now, record it, photograph it and keep it because it is so useful. Photograph everything. Really can't tell you how brilliant it is to do that. Um, another lesson is don't get rid of that two ton of lead that we got rid of because after we disposed of it from a lead merchant, physics recruited a new academic who's now going to be working with ID 131. And so, in fact, we are actually going to still use some open source in a different area. Ironically, they need all the lead which we disposed of. You need to be detailed and thorough. There's no shortcuts in decommissioning. You have to test everything. You can't do this quickly. It's going to be messy. Drains are messy. Extraction systems are messy. So if you don't want to be messy, do it externally. You must liaise with the Environment Agency. They really help inform what you need to do. And you use the expertise of the Environment Agency and other people to help you through this process. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the decommissioning team, past and present. So that's Dr Holt, Dr Preedy and Dr Lee, but also um, our wonderful technician Joan and Rod. The Chief Operating Officer and the rest of our senior leadership team who've allowed us to do this, the Project Management Board, our external RPA, John Scott from University of Leicester, Professor Peter Warwick, who was a retired academic who came back to help supervise the uh, PhD students who were left in the building and also give us his expertise, the Environment Agency who've been really helpful throughout this whole process, and of course, AURPO and SRP for the brilliant guidance documents you've got out there on decommissioning because that helped us provide that initial thought process.